And so now I'd like to welcome Kent Smith, the MLA for Eastern Shore, to say a few words. I was going to say, hold the applause till the end. Hold it to the end. <laughs> uh, before I start, I'd like to do a uh, quick land acknowledgments to say that we are on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd also like to recognize that um, the African Nova, Nova Scotian folks have been on this territory as well for over 400 years. So with that, I will say uh, briefly, thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we had hoped for 100. I think that we are at 51, I believe, registered. Anytime we get more than a dozen people out in Sheet Harbor, it's a good night, right? So thank you for coming. This is an important topic, obviously. We are so, so lucky uh, to have these three wonderful ladies here at the table this evening. Before I, I gush and go on about them, <laughs> I'll say, sorry, uh, I'll say that uh, I was talking to my girlfriend last night and I, uh, uh, I was talking about tonight and how, how great it is to have the, the top, top leadership of the health authority here. And I thought out loud, I was like, has the Minister of Health and Wellness ever been to Sheet Harbor before? And, in, in, you know, I'm from here, grew up here and thought about it. And of course, Kelly's not from here, so she didn't really have any idea. But then I saw Patty Henley when I came in tonight. And Patty, as everyone would know, 30 plus year nurse at the local hospital. I said, Patty, has the Minister of Health and Wellness ever been to Sheet Harbor before? And she thought for less than half a second and said, no, she could never remember the, the Minister of Health being here. So this is monumental, right? Like I'm 43, you guys are, some of you are older than, than 43. So the first time we've had the minister, the honorable minister of health and wellness, Ms. Michelle Thompson here in Sheet Harbor, please do not hold your round of applause to the end. <laughs> to the honorable minister's right, we have the deputy minister of health and wellness, Janine Lagasse. <laughs> and of course, we, we save the best for last. To the minister's left, the, the, the very top of the pyramid of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Ms. Karen Oldfield, CEO. So you are not here to hear me speak tonight. Uh, so I will, thank you, counselor, thank you. There's always one in every crowd and it's usually David. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to leave with a, with a few uh, very, very brief words to say, the healthcare system that we inherited uh, was not in, obviously, the best of shape. Uh, and we in Sheet Harbor, who have been watching the status of our, our hospital deteriorate over the last few years, would recognize that. And I'm really, really proud to be part of this team that has the leadership that we have right here, and especially with Minister Thompson in the middle. One of our colleagues at a caucus meeting not too long ago, MLA Chris Palmer, he had heard Michelle at his annual general meeting. She, he invited her to come and speak, and, and Michelle spoke. And he said at the caucus meeting that we don't, there's no better ambassador for the work that we're doing than Minister Thompson. And if any of you ever care to take 10 minutes of time and watch a quick video that I've posted on my Facebook about a month ago, Minister Thompson did a 10-minute speech in the legislature about the initiatives and the projects that we have put forward as a government in 15 months, and they're not going to grow roots like that, but they are going to grow roots. Premier Houston has said, we are going to fix it and it's going to take time. The, the initiatives and projects that we are putting in place right now are going to work. Give us some time. You will see that the, the improvement just in our local area in Sheet Harbor is measurable. And if you want to talk to Amy Donnelly, the boss at the hospital here, please go see what the ER closure stats are and what they've been for the last two years and the, the, the marginal improvement that we've seen. And it's only going to get better. So that is enough for me. I will say thank you once again for being here. And I will turn it over to these three wonderful ladies at the top of our healthcare leadership. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Thompson. I'm the MLA for Anaganish and uh, the Minister of Health and Wellness and uh, responsible for the Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment. Um, thank you, Kent, for being so kind and generous. I had a performance appraisal one time, and the gentleman that offered it to me said, you've nowhere to go but down, and that's how I feel a little bit right now. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm newly elected. Uh, Kent and I came in at the same time. I was elected in 2021 uh, with Premier Houston's uh, government. Very proud to serve uh, with the Premier and my caucus colleagues. I am a registered nurse by trade. Um, 
I've been a registered nurse about 30 years, 15 at the front line of those years, and then 15 in leadership or, or just different roles, not necessarily direct caregiving. So I certainly feel very privileged to, to be in this, in this job. So I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about what's been going on for the past 15 months. So we certainly received a strong mandate from Nova Scotians that healthcare was on the top of the agenda during the election, and that's for a number of reasons. And certainly as a healthcare, prior healthcare professional, I felt as well that healthcare uh, needed um, some significant attention uh, when I decided to run. So we began um, very quickly the day after we formed government to, um, with a new leadership team. And the leadership team consisted of the two folks that are sitting with me here today, as well as Dr. Kevin Orrell and Janet Davidson, who uh, is a thought leader, really, in, not only in this province, but in the country around health-related issues. She's quite accomplished. Uh, she's, her background would be registered nurse as well. And for the first time in the history of our province, uh, Department of Health and Wellness, which is the policymaker and the funder, uh, and the operator, Nova Scotia Health, are actually sitting at a table on a weekly basis, uh, making decisions with a system-wide approach. And that lens is across the system. While they each represent certain um, aspects of the system, the expectation is that we look and we strategically make decisions and we make them quickly um, and we make them with the best interests of the entire system. So it's been very, very fruitful is what I would say. And the meetings are just one thing. Um, thanks to technology, uh, there's daily conversations and, uh, you know, communication so that we're never far from one another uh, in terms of how we're managing healthcare. So after the new um, leadership team was uh, appointed, we then uh, went around the province, uh, the pre Premier, Houston and I, as well as the leadership team. We started in Niels Harbour, our group, and we went as far as Yarmouth and all points in between. And we spent a lot of time speaking to healthcare workers. We wanted to hear directly from them about their experience in healthcare over the past number of years. Not only about what was wrong, but we wanted to hear distinctly, uh, first voice from them, what the solutions were. How could we change the trajectory of healthcare from their lens as, as frontline care providers? And so that was incredibly helpful. Uh, and very humbling, even though I'd been in healthcare uh, my whole life, to to be involved with that was an incredible experience. So, from the voices and the suggestions of those healthcare workers, we uh, wrote Action for Health, and it's the first health plan, strategic health plan in this province in at least a dozen years, probably more. And it's actually accompanied by a website. So if you Google Action for Health, you'll find not only our strategic plan and the six pillars that we are focusing on, but at the bottom, as you scroll through, you'll see that uh, that there's an accountability website. So we ha are measuring things, sometimes annually, sometimes quarterly, and you'll be able to see how we are tracking our progress, where we're making strides, maybe where we're stalled, maybe where we need to make more improvements. And you'll also see that there'll be the previous day dashboard so that you can look in this province and see how the healthcare system performed. Um, emergency room visits, surgeries, response times for EHS, those types of things. That will mature over time but all in an effort to say that we want Nova Scotians to know what's happening in healthcare. We want there to be transparency so that you know and you can hold us accountable for the promises that we've made. So um, we're, we, we have lots of political will. We have a strong mandate from Nova Scotians. Certainly our budget this year, um, you know, money is, is, is not a barrier for us, that there has been significant investment in healthcare. And so now we are out in communities talking about the, ex the experiences of healthcare, but most importantly, what are the solutions that would fit your community? What are the things that are important to you? Not all communities are the same, as you know. Uh, we're all Nova Scotians, but there's a lot of uniqueness. And so uh, we want to talk and hear from you. We also want to tell you things that we're doing, what we're doing around recruitment and retention. We're working very, very hard to bring healthcare workers to Nova Scotia build capacity within the province, look at folks who've trained outside of our Nova Scotia borders or outside of our Canadian borders and bring them here to Nova Scotia to work. Immigration is going to be a key part of building our healthcare system and filling those vacancies, all the while growing our, um, our workforce from within. So if any of you have a young person in your life or someone who's you know early or mid-term mid career and they say, you know, I'm not sure if I'm happy, I wonder what I could do, there are jobs in every corner of our province in healthcare, and we certainly are interested. So 
While we hear a lot of negative things, I hope tonight you'll feel hopeful. There's a lot of good things happening in our healthcare system, and it is an incredibly uh, good job. It's it for me. Nursing has been meaningful, and I have felt it to be quite a noble career to to journey with families and patients over the years. And so, I would encourage you to encourage youth uh, in your community to consider healthcare, um, you know, as an option. So we'll go through a couple of things today. We want to talk about um, EHS. Uh, we'll touch on mental health and addictions. There's lots of folks here. So if we don't have the answers, we have a lot of really great people in the room who can get the answers that you have. So what we really want to do is just for you to feel welcome to ask your questions, uh, but also offer your solutions. And uh, we look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Just talk right into it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here tonight uh, with the minister and Karen. Um, this is the fourth uh, session like this that I've been able to attend. I unfortunately missed last night in Halifax, but I understand they had a really nice evening last night in Halifax as well. And it's just um, really exciting for us to be able to tell you the work that we have underway. But we also want to, to let you know that we know that there are still many, many things to do, that we don't want you to think that we know that what we've done is it, that there's a lot to be done. And that's why we want to hear about what's going on in your community so that you can let us know what is what you see, what you observe, as the minister said, potential solutions that you may have for us. Because I can tell you it does all make it back into conversations that the health leadership team have um, things that we advance in different areas of the department and the health authority. So just really looking forward to a conversation. And that's, that's really what we like it to be, is just a conversation with you um, back and forth and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say with us. Great. Thanks, Janine. I am. Hi. Um, last night uh, at the Halifax Forum, it was very interesting. Um, we learn, we, no matter where we go, we learn. And uh, one of the most important things that we are trying to do is, I use the expression, meet people where they are. And what, all I really mean by that is to, we need to understand where you are, what, what's happening in this community, what, what are the important things that are needed, that people want to see happen. and. Um, Fair be it for you know the suits from Halifax to come and 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 tell the community of Sheet Harbor and surrounding area what's what. It's far better for us to understand what your needs are and then try to meet them. So we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Normally we sit up here and you know take questions and answer the questions, but based on the questions that we did receive in advance, and there were a number. What we thought might be helpful is to have uh, Dr. Lisa Boning and, and Roberta to just set the table for everybody here and kind of let you know where they are in terms of um, responding to the needs of the community and specifically around the uh, model of care. There's been lots of ins and outs and lots of discussion and time and weeks and months and all the rest of it. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Boning and Roberta. You can, Lisa, why don't you come right up here by me and I will get another chair for Roberta. And we're going to start tonight by having them tell you where they are. And then what I'd like to talk about is barriers to realizing that vision, if there are any and then go forward from there. And then we can certainly talk about whatever questions, whatever hurdles, whatever challenges, and so forth. And maybe before I even give this microphone to um, Dr. Bonang, I'd just like a, a wave of hands. Um, all the frontline healthcare workers that are in the room, I, okay, so I see one, two, and three, and we have some in the back, and I heard, and I saw uh, some of the, uh, um, retirees. So there's there's a there's a number of you here and I like to start always by thanking you for what you've done for the province of Nova Scotia over the last two and a half, almost three years, and before that too, 
the last few years have been particularly hard on our frontline staff. And I, I, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when our healthcare workers were heralded across the country as the as heroes, you know, when Tim Hortons was giving out coffee and people were doing things for for our healthcare workers, and somewhere along the way, that fell by the by, and now our healthcare workers are feeling the brunt of the public's frustration with the system, and they're being called names and they're not being treated like heroes. It's not, some days it's not very fun to go to work, especially if you work in an ER or an ED. It doesn't really matter where you work. So I just, you know, I want to say thank you for what you do and, uh, and hopefully through the questions and what we talk about tonight, we'll all see uh, a tunnel of hope. So I'm going to ask Lisa to maybe start, and oh, you have mics there too. So, so this is casual, folks. I, 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 I didn't give them any forewarning until I got here tonight. So, so they certainly didn't come with, um, you know, the big notes and all that jazz. So, over to you. No prepared, no prepared statements. So, um, so for you, those of you who do not know me, as I said, I'm Dr. Lisa Bonang. I'm a family doc in Muscat Albert Harbor. I've been there for 27 years. I grew up in head of Chesapeake. So Eastern Shore is my home. I had my training and I came back because I wanted to come back to my community. And so I sit here as a resident of the shore. I sit here as a, f a front care worker, but my administrative hat is that I'm the site and primary care lead for the tri facilities, which include uh, Twin Oaks, Eastern Shore Memorial, and Muscatabit Valley Memorial Hospital. So in that role, I have been the co project manager, is that what we're called? Yeah. <laughs> for what started off is with um, looking at the model of care for Eastern Shore Memorial Hospital. Um, as of most recently, we had to look at our project charter and we've changed our project charter. Because when we started doing the work, we realized that really, as a community, all three needed to be worked on at the same time. Because if we're gonna work on as a network, we as the communities need to work together. What and utilize all of the resources and great people that we have working here to give as much services as we can for all the residents of the Valley and Eastern Shore. So I'm pleased to say we are getting that back together. Our first other big meeting is this coming Thursday. where we'll be bringing the team again together so that we get some serious, serious work done as quickly as we possibly can. I understand this has been a thing going on here for a very long time. And even when we started this work was over a year ago when we sat up to look at what, what we could do, what are our options, and how we could do better. We know that the residents here, what you're looking for is sustainable, predictable care. You've got access to primary care through the great physicians that have been here in, in this communities for a very long time, but there are other aspects of care that you haven't been able to access. And you're worried about that, and we know that. And we also feel that sense of urgency in trying to do the best we can for the facility as quickly as we can. We, of course, know there's been barriers, and we've come across barriers too. It's sometimes difficult to get models of changed care when you're working with three different sectors. You know, you have uh, EHS, our, our emergency services. You have the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and you have the Department of Health and Wellness. And we have to get them all at the same table, speaking the same language, and try to get all the work done. We're committed, Roberta and I have, we're committed to getting that done. Um, where are we at? So, so, we were supposed to go <laughs> to Cape Breton this week. Um, why we're going there is because we're going to go see North Sydney to see what an urgent treatment center model looks like. Why? That's sort of what we're trying to work towards here. Okay? We don't want to get caught up on what the nomenclature, what we call it. The whole idea is we're, we're looking at, in terms of provision of urgent care services as well, is how can we utilize what we have now? In the, we have a great facility in terms of the hospital. We've got great nursing staff there. How can we utilize those resources that we have there on site 24 seven? 
help them with their, their competencies, maximize their scopes of practice, utilizing and liaisoning with emergency health services and looking for them to help in terms of having physician oversight when there are not physicians necessarily here on site. How can we do that? Right. Well, how can we utilize our nurse practitioner for the services to augment those as well? So these are all things that we're looking at and trying to put into place and looking at those pieces and how we as a jigsaw can put them all together to hopefully be able to provide 24-7 um, care. It may not be always 24-7 emergency care, but at least consistent care that you as a community know that if I have something going on, I know that I can go to the hospital and liaison with emergency health services and get the care that I need and the access to care that I need in a timely manner. Awesome. <laughs> what else do you want to add there? <laughs> Yeah, it was really good. I, there's not much to say. Yeah. I'm Roberta Duchesne. I'm Lisa's co-lead for Eastern Shore, the Eastern Shore Muscadabit Valley Network. Um, Lisa's pretty much said everything. The only thing that I wanted to add to that is the virtual care piece is super hugely important. Um, and it's part of what we're trying to plan for for this new model of care. Um, and the access point will be 911, of course. But if somebody comes into the hospital and needs something, the idea is that we're 24-7. We're there. Somebody will, will help you get to where you need to go. That's very basically the idea. I just, uh -huh. Okay, so before, um, so that's great, and thank you both. So I guess the, well, don't you run away now. Don't you run away. <laughs> to be, yeah, no, no, just hang on for a sec. Uh, I, I think an important question, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I, I'm, you got the three of us, so you, you talked about, you know, all the cats, all, hurting all the cats. So NSH, EHS, department, blah, blah, blah. So we're here. And it doesn't get a whole lot higher. So I'd really like to know what you, what you see as the current obstacles or barriers to, you know, getting t from where you are today to what you've just described, because I'm hoping that we can fill in around the edges and answer some of the questions and remove some of those barriers because at the end of the day, that's our job. So the first, yeah. um, barrier number one, sustainable funding. So that's in different pots. One's be sustainable funding to help augment uh, nursing services, right? Because if we're going to change the model of care, we're going to need initial resources, uh, initial full-time time equivalents for nursing staff to be able to do things like triage incoming people for if you're booking patients such as in an urgent treatment care model. Um, but that's also going to include funding to help train people and augmenting their scopes of practice. That's not my bailiwick. I'm a physician. What do I know about that? But, but you know, that, that's one thing. <laughs> yeah. So, and the idea is to have RN prescribers at the sites. So all of the staff, all of the RNs would be RN prescribers, the LPNs working to their fullest scope, and then CCAs within the nursing units as well so that they can pick up the pieces where the RNs are not necessarily there. Second, um, Department of Health and Wellness. <laughs> we need to stop putting people and sort of saying, okay, this is a level four emergency department, okay? During the day, it's fee for service. It's always been fee for service, okay? You are never gonna recruit another physician here. From fee for service, you were just not, right? Um, I thought we had this all worked out. As of tonight, I am found out that, no, we don't have this all worked out in terms of sustainable funding um, on an APP, both for 
a new physician, as well as for locum physicians. Because if we're gonna try to track them, people wanna know, this is what I'm going to make, right? Um, we got the extension where we could have locum services, right? Um, sure, sure, okay, sorry. So fee for service means uh, I get paid for what I do, okay? So for everything I do as a physician, it's gonna get a little complicated, but each thing I do as a physician, it's assigned units, okay? So for example, an office visit is worth 36 units, okay? And through our master agreement, that's our contract that we have with the Department of Health and Wellness, there's a unit money value per unit. And that dictates how much I get paid to see you in the office, for example. So I work in Muscadabit Harbor at Twin Oaks. I'm on an alternate payment plan because I'm in a CEC, Collaborative Emergency Center. I am no longer fee-for-service. I was, I am no longer am. So I know what it's like to be a fee-for-service physician. I get paid an hourly wage, so I submit my hours. So I know I have consistent funding no matter how many people I see. It's not really an issue right now necessarily in my uh, emergency because we're busy, right? But over historically, the unit value is paid for a community emergency department visit never got raised. So a unit, when I see somebody, if I was on fee for service in, a, uh, in an emergency, level four emergency department, I get paid, I think seven, it's seven units or 17 units, which is not hardly anything, right? You could not come to this. I mean, your emergency department is gonna be busier, but it's not a very busy emergency department. So somebody's coming here and would not make nearly the same amount of funds or money that they would if they were working as a hospitalist, if they were working in another emergency department that has usual, like a, uh, any of the higher level emergencies who are all paid in, as an hourly wage. Okay, does that help? Okay, um, I lost my train of thought because you had me do that, but okay. Um, so, so in terms of, so if, if if we're going to be able to recruit not only a hopefully a permanent physician because ultimately our goal is, is succession planning, you know, our three physicians we are working here are getting older, they're going to think about retiring and we need to have not only a model of care that's going to be attractive, we also have to have a funding scheme that's going to be attractive. And, you know, Amy's got some great stats on here. Uh, we've been able to recruit uh, two locum physicians that are now starting to do some shifts in the ED. And if we don't have that sustainable funding to keep them coming here and to try to hopefully attract others to come here, you're never, again, there's lots of competition. You're not gonna get somebody to come out in Sheet Harbor on a fee-for-service basis when they can go work anywhere else and get much more money, period. Uh, the third thing is working with our partners in emergency health services, because we, we, they, they're experts in providing that oversight. So when there are not physicians on site, we need somebody that's gonna be able to help our nursing staff who are at the facility to know that they have somebody that they can call that can support them in the provision of care. And you know, sometimes they require just to say, yeah, you're doing the right thing, good, treatment can happen, they can go home. I use the example of you know, we have developed a, a suturing module <laughs> that started with Suzanne and myself in Twin Oaks. Um, it's now going provincial, right? And you know, so training our RN, so having the competencies, they just, they can do this, they just need to say, yeah, okay, you go ahead that can save somebody from having to travel another two hours just to get sutures, mm -hmm. right? So that's an example of just having things, but we also need other things in place to have that oversight with EHS to be able to do our models of care. So some of the things that we've talked about while we were doing our planning, and some of these things have been things that the community, we, we've worked with um, some members of the community, created a worked with them to create a community advisory committee that now sits with the Chamber of Commerce. 
um, under civic affairs and they're right back there in the corner. Um, and some of the things that we've talked about there is why are we taking people to Dartmouth General um, if they're sick? Why are we not going to Aberdeen from this community? That is also a piece of work that I think we should be talking about because it's taking the trucks off the road um, and the system status plan pieces all need to be adjusted. So that's a challenge for us as well. Muscadabit Valley is also closer to Truro. Um, so those are, are pieces that we need to think about a little bit differently so that we're getting access to care quicker. Um, virtual care. Oh, sorry. Virtual care, um, setting up virtual care in these, in these smaller sites, Muscadabit Valley. Um, and Eastern Shore Memorial, I think it would be really great to be able to do, yeah, yeah. Virtual Care ED is where you have a physician that may be off-site, so there's a trial going on now, a pilot project, where a physician in Truro is providing virtual emergency service for lower level of Ill, lower levels of illness. Um, through the hospitals in these smaller sites. So there's two pilot projects happening now. I think one is in Niels Harbor. Um, and we're trying to get signed up to have that happen here. So they've come, they've, they've done a, a walkthrough with me last week. And we're just waiting to hear about that too. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just help you with that. So um, virtual ED. At the very beginning of COVID, um, one of the young doctors in, at Colchester in Truro um, said, there's got to be something that we can do. Uh, she, she actually had a little bit of extra time on her hands. She was an emergency doc in Truro. And at the beginning of COVID, not as many people were going to emerge because every, we were all didn't know what we were dealing with and people were kind of staying home. So she used the time to create, uh, you know, she just kind of cooked it up herself. And it, what, what has come from this, uh, she, she worked with our research innovation and discovery team, and they've, the model exists today as follows. There's a physical room uh, identified close to the emergency in the hospital, which has a nurse. There will be a nurse there. There'll be somebody on site that can actually see the the um, uh, the patient, and the eMERGE doc is not necessarily on site. Could be home, could be somewhere else, but not on site. And through the technology, uh, the nurse is able to explain, you know, that how the patient is presenting. And the eMERGE doc is able to um, say, we, we do this, we do that, and so on and so forth. So the eMERGE doc can actually be, in, let's just use that example, Jan's example. She could be sitting home in Truro, and she may be seeing patients at Colchester Regional. She could be seeing patients at other hospitals uh, along the northern shore. So we have a pilot project there. We have a pilot project in Niels Harbor. We have, a, we have several more projects coming. So these are not for every emergency, as you can imagine. It would be for the lower acuity things, and it is a way to stretch the resources. Uh, so, so far, it's, it's worked quite well. And so if you've had the fo them, which is us, down, um, Roberta, and you know, you've kind of signed up, then that's a good thing. So I would expect that you would see that soon. I mean, we're trying to use that model uh, where it works in, in uh, outside of, um, you know, particularly outside of HRM, but frankly, we could use it, well, I say outside of HRM, this still is HRM, outside of the city proper, uh, in as many smaller and community hospitals as possible to stretch the resources. So it's not the be all and end all. It's just yet another tool that helps. And so I'm glad you've had them down. So uh, that's good. Thank you. OK. A lot of things have been raised here. You've, you've both um, given lots of fodder. There's lots of things that we could actually uh, speak to. And then, of course, we want to hear from, 
folks in the audience, but I think what, what you've um, presented is sort of the, the goal and the vision and three hurdles. Were there others too, uh, Lisa? Or? So we have funding, we have um, the physician aspect in terms of pay, and we have EHS. Those are the three I have. The three big rocks. Okay, so maybe we can, we, we can talk about that. So look, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for helping and for setting the table, just so people know where you are and the work that you've done, which is obviously a lot. And so thank you for everything that you are doing. Appreciate it. Okay, so where do you guys want to start? I'll start a little bit around um, EHS, but Jeff Fraser is here. I can't see him. He's hiding behind. There he is, peekaboo. <laughs> so, so Jeff, I'm going to start a little bit around EHS, but I'd really appreciate it if you'd fill in the gaps because I'm sure I'll miss some things. So um, to Dr. Bonang's point about EHS, so we know that we need to strengthen the system, and uh, certainly we are doing uh, a lot of work in order to do that. And I just want to speak briefly about the oversight, and you can tell me if this is what you're talking about. So one of the things that has been implemented is we now have a physician in the medical calm center. So there's a physician that's overseeing all of the calls uh, in the province and can see what's going on and wherever possible or wherever needed can reach in to support paramedics in the field. And sometimes that's uh, because there's very acute folks who need um, some support around medication or perhaps a tube or different things in terms of the emergency care. But sometimes there are folks who call for 911 who have lower acuity and they don't actually uh, need those intensive um, paramedic services that, 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 that our paramedics are trained to provide. But they do need some assessment and they need access. So the physician works with the paramedic on site to say what it is that could possibly uh, happen. And so we call that uh, doctor our doc in the box. And so the doc in the box helps provide treatment. And sometimes uh, that physician will say, you know, actually, I think it, it's appropriate for you to wait based on the assessment that we have in your vitals and the, all of these things. They work in concert using a paramedic to the fullness of his or her scope as well as the physician and that person may be um, actually not transported to hospital in fact they don't need to go which is uh, actually through that program i think four out of ten people are now um, actually not transferred to hospital that there's another access point for them uh, and then uh, there are other times that that they can actually treat and release uh, the patient and uh, that may be for a faint, as an example, if somebody faints, it's always scary. Someone fainted at Remembrance Day the other day, and the first thing was called 911. I said, she didn't even hit the ground. Let's just wait. She's 20, and she's pale, and I don't think she had breakfast. So can we just wait a second? <laughs> but anyway, 911, and I'm standing there thinking, please come. And they did. They were there in like like four and a half minutes, so it was perfect. And, and she was able to be treated and released as a result of that intervention because, you know, she was safe, and, and they were able to do that. So... The other thing that we're looking at in terms of response times, and I know in rural communities people are worried about it, is how long it takes for EHS to come to uh, uh, when, we, when we call. And so really working hard to separate uh, the transfers. Uh, so historically, transfers happened by EHS in this province. So if you were low acuity and needed to be transferred between two sites, you would go with two paramedics. But we've worked really hard, uh, and Jeff's team has worked really hard to... Um, hire non-paramedic operators for transfer trucks because you're safe to go with people who have like a low level of training to transfer you. And a year ago, 86% of people were being transferred by paramedics and we're now down to 22%, which is pretty significant. And we have a goal of 5%. And what that allows us to do is our very highly skilled paramedics in this province to respond to 911. So there are other issues that we need to, we have to look at offload times and all of these different things, but we do have a team now led by Jeff um, with uh, paramedic union, paramedic college, um, Department of Health and Wellness, Nova Scotia Health, looking at these really complex problems and trying to find solutions that work not only in Metro, because their issues are different than, than rural Nova Scotia issues, but how do we better support rural Nova Scotia as well. So there is a lot of work happening. I don't know, Jeff, you want to add, or Janine, if there's something else you yeah, want Just before Jeff, I think the thing that I think is, if you want to turn a problem into something exciting, is that previously the issue that Dr. Bonang raised about having some oversight or having access to a physician, not necessarily on site, 
would have been a very siloed problem that we would have said to the NSH, you look after that. But now we're looking at it as a system problem. And so traditionally, the ED wouldn't necessarily have had direct contact with EHS, but EHS has a resource now in that physician, the doc in the box, and we're saying, well, why are we just using it over here? Why can't we also use it over here to help out Dr. Bonang and the community here? So we just want people to know that we are looking at all of the resources that we have and then saying, how can we best use them, deploy them, and help you to solve your problems? So there are, we're, those are the things that we're looking at. But Jeff, over to you. A fact to follow. <laughs> so I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm the regulator. I, I represent the minister as a regulator of emergency health services. And there's not a lot I can add. They did a great job of highlighting all the changes we're putting in place. Everything we're doing is trying to create capacity within our system. And we had capacity, but we've got some challenges with staffing, and we've got some challenges with demand. And some of the patients that we see within our program are actually not, they really don't need an ambulance, to the minister's point. So what we need to do is we have to look at things differently and stop using a sledgehammer on a thumbtack for all the calls. And we, have, we really have to reorganize ourselves. Uh, part of what we're doing with this separating out the transfer capability, we were one of the few jurisdictions in Canada that didn't do that. So we're aggressively pushing that now. As, and so we can save our, create, paramed, uh, create capacity and save our paramedics for when we truly need them in the communities. Rural Nova Scotia is a challenge for us. We have a lot of uh, road network and a lot of calls, and we have to reorganize our system to make sure that we have a presence in these communities so we can support the health authority as they're changing their systems. To, to the deputy's point, the nice thing about this is we're not building it in isolation, we're building it together. And every decision is made in concert at a table. So it's like a major project plan that we've rolled out. I worked in the system for about 30 years as a paramedic, as a paramedic leader. Uh, retired back in February of 2021 and I came back as a regulator uh, on this side because I have so much passion about what we do so I, it's it's been interesting over the last few nights to listen to people's stories but I want to assure you we know we have challenges and we are very very committed to working through those we have a uh, our, our motto really is is that we cannot fail we must do and so we'll continue to drive those changes through and we're happy that we can support where we can Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm, I perhaps might just touch on um, the first uh, hurdle or barrier that Dr. Bonang raised on the funding side, talking about nursing services, the FTEs that would be required to triage. They would need training. RN prescribers would need training. These are, I, I, I shouldn't say easy problems to solve, but they're pretty easy problems to solve. I mean, the, the, you know, knowing what the issue is, like I could pretty much go down the list and say tick, tick, tick. So, you know, that's where folks want to head. We definitely can support that and resolve all of those uh, matters and I, I don't see any long-term issue there. And on the uh, physician model of pay, I'm pretty sure we can get that sorted out too. Like so knowing what they are, putting them on the table. Now we just really need to put some time frames around it and get going. And I'm very pleased that, um, I'm really happy that you're going down to the north side to see, to, to see what they did do in Sydney. We've been there a few times. And um, you know, th this was a, an eMERGE that was closed for a long time, a really long time. And just a beautiful facility, but you know, shuttered. And so folks came together, worked out the model. It's been in operation now for um, I'm thinking just coming on a year, and uh, people are loving it. They're just loving it. So it's really added a lot to the community, and so I think you'll learn a lot when you go there. In fact, to be honest, when I went there, I said they can do more. So um, uh, it, it's good. So I don't see any long, any major hurdles on what you've presented, Roberta and um, and Dr. Bonang. So you know, with that, I'd like to maybe throw it out to people to hear what you have to say, what you think, your questions. They could be on anything we've talked about or anything else that uh, is on your mind too. Okay, thank you. So uh, what I would ask is we get to the, the, uh, the opportunity for you to ask questions right now. And 
If you have a card that you would like to read, you can just put your hand up and we have the runners that will come over and I'll just point to you. I said I feel like an auctioneer because I do the pointing, so I know it's rude to point. I know that's, but I'm not sure how else to do it. So I will, um, as you have questions, um, we do have some pre-submitted questions. So if people um, don't have anything they want to ask, we can read from those. Oh, we have our first question over here. And I will also say that if we don't get to all of the questions tonight or if you've submitted questions and you don't get a chance because we really do want to hear from everyone in the room tonight. If we don't get a chance to answer all those questions, you will hear back. Um, our team here is really committed to making sure that people get answers to the questions that they submit. So I just want to assure everyone, if we don't get to everyone's questions tonight, we will have an opportunity or you will hear back. So without that, we'll pass it over here. Thank you. Um, is it on? Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I'm just wondering, talking about funding, major barriers, um, so I'm a primary care paramedic, for example, I do the same job, but for the most part I can't give the nice drugs, so like the narcotics when you have a broken leg and you're 10 out of 10 pain, um, or some of the fancy tricks that are definitely life-saving. Um, so I'm looking to further my career uh, being younger in this job. Um, it's incredibly expensive, and Nova Scotia is one of the very few provinces that actually doesn't do some type of discounted um, tuition. So, uh, for example, New Brunswick, um, they'll do, you know, you can get half your um, tuition back once you complete your program. So if you're trying to encourage paramedics, because we definitely need physicians, we love physicians, um, but, you know, we are the ones on the road bringing them to you guys. So if you want more of us, it's incredibly expensive. I've done St. Mary's University, and this is almost three times the price. And we only go up in terms of pay so much, and then we cap. So, so, so thank you for that question. Um, we are looking at how we, what we would call laddering. So how do we ladder people uh, in professions um, to the next level if they want to go there? So we have nothing tangible yet. I don't think Jeff's getting up, but it, is there something you want to say, Jeff? Like we are definitely looking at how we create a career pathway for folks. So starting with the non-paramedic drivers, is there an opportunity for them to become PCP, primary care paramedics, primary care paramedics to advanced care paramedics, and then to critical care paramedics? So you can, we want to assist you to do that. So yes, we are looking at that now. We're also looking at it in other professions as well. So um, continuing care assistants, CCAs, are they interested in training to become licensed practical nurses, LPNs, LPNs to RNs, RNs to NPs? It's not for everybody, it's, and it's not an expectation, but for those folks that want to do that, how do we create clear lines of sight to potential uh, opportunities to ladder in your career? So it just, I would say stay tuned, but it, you're right on track, yep. Thank you. Another question over here, and then, and then I, and then I do see you. Okay, next. Okay, first I have to apologize because I didn't make it to all the tables. But my one, I have a couple questions. One has to do with um, obviously our aging population, um, and I'm an empath, so I like to help a lot. But I do have a problem with not being able to find like a senior advocate program of some sort. Um, where I can go even anonymously saying, hey, my neighbor or someone I met is having real issues, um, either A, is there something we can do for them, or have someone be directed to them um, and get the help that they need, um, which brings me to the virtual care, and obviously I didn't make it to that table, but I don't know if that was like someone sitting at home and talking on their computer to a doctor per se and getting help, but I know a lot of the seniors around here don't have access to computers or know how to use computers, and if there's a computer that could sit at the hospital that they can have access to or someone to help them access it, because that's kind of like where I'm having issues with virtual care, so to speak. It's great for people around my age group or people who are around computers where you're getting up into that higher aging bracket. They don't use computers, don't want to use computers or don't have access to that. And I find that maybe a lot of that 911 calls or whatever is for our aging seniors. And, you know, we need to find a way to help them as well. So true. I mean, actually, the stats would show you that we, we get call, that there are calls, 911 calls, that, that one could actually attribute to loneliness. To loneliness. So, leaving that aside, I'd, I want to speak to the virtual care. So, you're, you're right. And, um, this is a challenge. There's two challenges. One, one is 
that um, not everybody has access to a computer. Not everybody knows, is not computer literate. And secondly, there are places in Nova Scotia where cell coverage and internet coverage is not, is not what it should be. Yes. Yes, I know, my phone's not working well. So, so, yeah. So, that doesn't really help, does it? No. That's another problem, which we partner with Elon Musk to fix. Okay, so, but coming back to the computer literacy part of it, um, I'll just share what one community has done, and we're, that's starting to be copied in other communities. Um, you know, if, if, if the community, and I'm looking at Sheet Harbor back down there, you know, if you have a, if the chamber, if Tom McGinnis has a good idea, he, he should get on with it, okay? Uh, so what they did in um, the Aberdeen Hospital Foundation, partnered with the library in New Glasgow, and they found a little space in the, in the library and the foundation paid for it. So there's a computer and there's somebody to help older folks to sign up for virtual care, to get through their virtual care appointment and so on and so forth. So recognizing the, the very point that you raised. So that um, was shared you know, amongst the foundations and there's another one going in place in Bear River. It's a similar kind of a thing. So, so if that's something that is of interest to the community, there, there are ways to help with it. And that's just dealing with the computer literacy and the access to a computer. It doesn't really solve the internet problem. So that's one, one thing that I would just uh, put out there. Second thing, and it's not, really on, it's not really on your specific question, but I, I want to raise it while it's on my mind. The province just announced, uh, I think last week, um, a $2 million communities fund that, that would help communities such as Sheet Harbor, surrounding area, to um, recruit physicians and healthcare professionals. So you, you probably have the, the link for that, Kent, and if you don't, I'm happy to share it. So there's an opportunity for communities to actually apply for funding to help with whatever outreach efforts are, are deemed to be a good plan for the community. So I didn't want to, um, I made a note, but I just wanted the opportunity to sort of put that out there too. So thinking of advocacy and ways to, you know, get the word out, uh, there, is a, there is a mechanism to apply for funds to actually help with that. Just, I'll just speak quickly to um, some of the work around seniors. So we actually do have a minister of seniors and long-term care. Her name is Barb Adams, and she is a uh, physiotherapy who has a history working in um, community-based rehab as well as long-term care, and she's quite passionate about the file. Uh, to be generous, yeah, she's, she's pretty, uh, she's, she's a terrific advocate. But recently, the three of us, uh, Nova Scotia was invited to go to Denmark, and uh, we were able to go and look at their healthcare system. And they, uh, actually the municipalities um, are responsible for senior and home care uh, in their very complex government system. And uh, actually one of the, the tools that they have is that they do an assessment at 65 years of age, whether you want it or need it or not, you start to be uh, engaged in the system. So identifying seniors really early and kind of looking at your next year. How can we keep you mobile? How can we keep you fit doing falls prevention and really assessing you also for loneliness? And so it becomes an annual issue. So there is, um, you know, we're, we're in the very early stages of talking about what that looks like. Now we were in Copenhagen. So it's when you're in Copenhagen, you're in the city. And what does that look like in rural De Denmark? I, I'm not as clear about, but certainly we've talked about that and also using those rehab programs and, and looking at home care as an example, like it's, you know, when you get in, how do you get out? So looking at rehabilitation programs that are very specific to your activities of daily living. So what do you need to stay in your home? You need to do your laundry, cook a meal and, you know, whatever those three things are. And so your rehab program is targeted around that work um, to make sure that you are able to, to remain in your home as long as possible. So um, 
I can try and get a better answer for you, but I know that seniors in long-term care are really looking at how we support because of the demographic. Oh, yeah. Oh, you want to? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. Sure, that's okay. Um, my name is Cynthia Stillwell, and I'm one of the managers with Continuing Care. Um, and uh, I have the privilege of being the manager for um, the more rural areas of our central zone in Nova Scotia Health. And um, so I sort of live breathe both in professionally and in my own family <laughs> the kind of thing that you were just speaking about um, I just wanted to highlight um, something that I've witnessed that's working really well in Muscadabit Harbor to uh, maybe you already know about it you there so, could be someone here that could even speak to it, but I just Googled it. I'm not sitting over here just checking things out on Facebook. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the old school community gathering place in Muscadabit Harbor has some really innovative programs. I don't pretend to know how they're funded, how they're funded, what's happened, but I know that in can, some perfect woohoo i'm singing your praise <laughs> but i do know that we've had some great success and hopefully they agree uh, with partnership with our continuing care coordinator um, through nova scotia health and the people who are empaths as you say who would like to be able to help the seniors in the community that I'll let you speak to what you do, but but um, you, there is a, um, a wellness navigator, I believe, and a seniors navigator there. We've had some great support offered through that program in partnership with Continuing Care, which um, feeds up through Department of Seniors and Long Term Care, and um, so we've been able to, you know, we almost have a kind of a little gem of a model, I think, happening in partnership. You know, if I'm speaking with the care coordinator in that area, she'll say, I already reached out to the old school and, and then go on. And so as I look at that website, there's some wonderful programs that are being offered, but they are connected to the community and to some of the health services around. So I just wanted to congratulate you and celebrate. Like that is a really excellent model. Um, Perhaps you could speak more to it, but I think you know those are ways as well that we can partner with local communities and you know uh, with our our care coordinators, our community rehab team. We want to be able to be part of conversations in local communities that are happening, so we can build on what the rich um, options that are present in your communities. So uh, I really enjoy. Um, hearing about those kinds of things, so I thought it was worth mentioning and celebrating. The other thing I would say is Caregivers Nova Scotia, um, while, while if you come to Continuing Care, we, we can't recommend a private person or a specific volunteer. That, we're, that would be beyond what we're able um, to do from a, a, because we work with Nova Scotia Health broadly, but uh, Caregivers Nova Scotia is an excellent resource for being able to contact either online or um, um, by telephone. They have uh, caregiver support groups and so on. And so if you know of someone that's wanting to volunteer, you can actually register with them and make, you know, make it known that you have services you want to offer. So just want to put that out there as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's great. I think we had a question up here too. Thank you. Hello? Okay. <laughs> so I just want to take a little bit of a step back um, to the first question that we had about funding. And we're always talking about recruitment for nursing, for doctors, and so on. And it's well known that nursing and being a physician and a provider is a fulfilling job. But um, things have become increasingly expensive and fulfilling is no longer um, an aspect we look for necessarily in our, in our job search. So uh, becoming a nurse is a very expensive endeavor. It costs a lot of student loans and a lot of time. Um, is there any plan in the future to kind of offer more like subsidized learning for anyone who wants to become a nurse or who wants to continue studies in that department and to kind of help recruit people who make it more appealing, more than just fulfillment? I'll start. So um, I guess it depends on, uh, there'll be a few things. So I'll start with um, continuing care assistance as an example. So continuing care assistance. Um, last year, um, I'm very proud. Prior to being elected, I worked in long-term care. And so uh, we did raise the wages for continuing care assistance in this province. They got a 23% wage increase. And um, 
it was an incredible boost to the people in the sector who are the backbone of long-term care and home care, um, and also are increasingly visible and necessary in acute care. So there's a couple of things that have happened. So for continuing care assistance, it is free to go to that go through that program at NSCC, and um, you know you get you know everything waived. I think your books and things are all included. The other thing that some nursing homes are doing is called PLAR. So it's prior learning. So it's recognition of prior learning. So if you come with a skill set um, from other areas of your life, you can come into a long-term care facility. If there's a vacancy, they will train you for a certain period of time and they will support you as you go through the modules and you achieve your um, your certificate as a continuing care assistant. So that's one of the things. I will tell you that um, this year in September, I, I don't know the numbers prior to, but they were low. That's what I would say. Uh, and we have over a thousand people registered in the continuing care assistant program through NSCC this year, which is at least triple, at least triple what we had in 2018, 2019. So that's really important. Uh, we are looking at, um, you know, in terms of how we support registered nurses and licensed practical nurses. And I do know that some of it sits with us and some of it sits with the feds. So there is, particularly in rural communities, there is tuition relief programs that are available through the federal government to support and offset. In hard to recruit areas, there are uh, also sign-on bonuses that are quite generous. So uh, when folks come into the, the profession, so we're looking all the time, we're in, in constant contact with the unions and uh, you know understanding what the experiences are of students and also how we support people to ladder. So we're in the early days of that, but I do know that there are some things that are happening and we're looking at how we attract more people to the, to the profession. Yes, I'll just add a few things. The, um, you know, we've kind of talked around it a little bit, but, you know, I like to go right to it, which is that at the end of the day, it's all about the people. It, it doesn't matter what sector, it's all about the people. In the healthcare sector, it is really all about the people right now. If we can't get the people, if we can't retain the people, number one, recruit the people, number two, and it doesn't matter, nurse, paramedic, respiratory technologist, OT, PT, uh, you know, we, we often just go talk about nurses and doctors, but it, it is a much greater spectrum, so I, I, I want people to understand that, though we may just say nurse, doctor, in, in my mind at least, it's, it's much more than that. And there are some um, technical positions that are very difficult to fill. And uh, so, we, you know, one of the things we've done there is to, we've gone into a partnership with Michener Institute for additional lab techs, as an example. We just can't seem to, you know, get enough, keep enough. Um, so we're really looking at so many different things and, and just kind of back to the tuition subsidies, relief and so forth. Um, I was excited when the province announced that, you know, there's a job on the table for every, every nurse graduate for the next five years. I, I could comfortably say for the next 10 years, frankly, because in the province, we're graduating as between Dalhousie, St. of X and CBU, about 478 nurses, graduates a year. I look today and we have, um, Oh, there's over 1,500 vacancies in the province. So if you just, you know, simple math, if all of those graduates stayed, then we lop off retirements, we lop off maternity leaves or other leaves of absence, maternity, paternity, et cetera. Like we, we aren't, we need more to even to stay status quo. So, Things like the subsidies and helping people to, to um, complete their education, it's, it's important. And uh, there are some bursaries and subsidies within the, within the system, but that's, that's great. Once you get in, when you're a student, it's a little different. The only thing you can kind of have in the back of your mind is, okay, I have a job offer. Like, for example, my niece, she's in second year uh, nursing at... Uh, at St. of X, and this job offer thing came out uh, 
in October last year. She was in her second month of school, she, and she says, well, this was a great ROI. She says, I, I, I've gone to, I, exactly. She says, um, you know, I've been in school for a month, and now I have a job. So, you know, th that's how she looked at it, which is great, but it doesn't pay the bills at the time. So I, I take your point, and, um, you know, we have to do the things that need to be done to, to keep our to find our young students, to keep them in school, and to keep them motivated to get them out the other end and to ladder them. So, go ahead, Kent. I'll speak a little bit too. I was just mentioning the Canada Student Loan Forgiveness Program. So, it's a little bit up in the air right now. The most recent information I have from Sean Frazier is that uh, in the new year, maybe I'll rewind. There's a Canada Student Loan Forgiveness Program. So if you're a, in healthcare, I think for a doctor, it's up to $40,000 worth of Canada Student Loans that the federal government will forgive. And if you're a nurse, I think it was $20,000. That's if you go and work in rural. The problem with Sheet Harbor is we've been considered not rural because we're part of HRM. So that is the problem. So the solution is that, uh, according to Sean Frazier, David? David? David says no. Um, so the solution to that problem is that obviously Sheet Harbor is going to be granted an exception. I believe uh, Muscovy Valley is in the same boat. But the answer I got from Sean Fraser's office was that it was not going to happen immediately. They were going to do a jurisdictional scan across Canada to see if there were any other situations like Sheet Harbor, like Middle, that, were, that they could fix in one fell swoop. So I was told that by January that should be rectified. And they campaigned on the fact that they were going to up that from the 40 and 20 to 60,000 uh, for doctors, and I think it was 40,000 for nurses, and expanded for other uh, other sectors as well. So it wasn't just going to be healthcare; they were going to look at adding that to to education. I believe was was one of it as well. So stay tuned for that, and and I'll look for to Sean for an update as well. But okay. So I would say what, like, I, so you're, you're a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, you can consider yourself a unicorn. And so what I would say is, you know, we need to look across all levels of government. So, you know, we're working with municipalities around recruitment and retention in local communities. The province has a role to play and the feds have a role to play. So it's really around seeing how we can leverage each of the assets so there may not be a federal program for paramedicine but if that's something that we're looking at in the province and we can leverage and lean in then that's you know that augments something else so um you know we we just have to look at all three levels of government and how do we how do we supplement and augment one another so don't be discouraged is what i would say yeah yeah we have another question over here and did you want to Hi, just building on that, um, I'm a teacher at the local school here and with children who are going into jobs, I've seen so many who have wanted to become physicians or RNs but have grown up in poverty who do not have the ability to study. And while they're bright lights, they do get quite a few scholarships for their first year of school or their, their second year. Those who have chosen to, do, to continue on with school um, and pursuing medicine, it's year three when they get hit hard and they can no longer afford it. And so often they drop out. Would it not be maybe an idea that we, when students are starting to apply, it, I know they, they start in pre-med, I'm not 100% sure how people become physicians, but then they also, then they also apply to their med program. Would it not be worth it for students who we know who are coming from a federal area, uh, for a rural area, if they are going to become a doctor, if they get some funding, if if when they and they're, when they're in their third year, I know that that's not possible. But if they make the promise that they're coming back to the rural area, I know. Just a thought. No, I don't it's know. a very good thought. So. Um, you know, a couple of things around that. I think, first of all, if the community recognizes or sees, and, and you would see this coming through school, for sure, um, a student who shows an in inclination 
to some one of the professions in the healthcare uh, sector. Um, if they are, if, if communities can kind of rally around them. We do have places in Nova Scotia where that happens. So, for example, I'm thinking of, um, actually I'm thinking of Shelburne, and I'm thinking of how two young people were identified there as wanting to become physicians. And uh, they had a challenge, and, and actually, you, you may have all read where um, CBU, Cape Breton University, is thinking about a medical school, but, but as a precursor, they've, I, they have a program with Dalhousie University right now to, I think there's five or six, five, uh, students are are um, going through. They're being supported to go through Dalhousie Medical School with the promise that, and they've signed on day one of medical school, they've signed an agreement that says they will go back to rural Nova Scotia. And actually, one of those individuals in that group of five is is from the Sheet Harbor. Group. Oh, I'm sorry, Sheet Harbor. If that was Freudian. Maybe it's a, maybe I was just dreaming of it uh, of the Shelburne area. So, so there's always a way. There's always a way, but but we have to find them, find those promising students and help them. Like I really do believe going forward that that communities have an important part to play, and that's why I raised this communities fund because we know from the evidence that if a person um, People, at some point in their career, they will go home. Very likely to go home. And maybe they'll stay, like Lisa, okay? Lisa stayed or came back. I'm not sure which, Lisa. I think you stayed. <laughs> she got to Halifax. <laughs> and then she came home. So, you know, but, but we know the evidence, and it doesn't matter. It could be a nurse. It could be a physician. It could be another... Um, healthcare professional p people do tend to go home at some stage in their career or if a community wraps its arms around the person and helps them by a, verse, a bursary or other um, or other tool then there's a very good chance the individual will stay in the community and just, to, uh, just to follow up I'm not texting I just knew I had something on my phone that I wanted to refer to and not give you the wrong information so um, in 2019, Dalhousie University uh, designated 16 seats, and those 16 seats um, um, through the so you have to meet the entrance criteria, of course. And then um, folks who are from rural communities, First Nation community, or African Nova Scotia communities are recognized, and those seats are designated specifically to ensure that there's better representation in the uh, in the Dalhousie Medical School specifically. And I know that there are designated seats as well in the nursing programs. So we are working. I think there's your idea is good. And I think it's something that we can we can bring back and talk about. So thank you very much. I'm just just to, I, I just want to add one thing to that as well. And I think your point is great because we've talked about this a lot actually at the health leadership team about how we identify those students early as well, right? And what we can do to work with you as teachers and if the with the education system, because as Karen said earlier and the minister, that we really want people to see this as a long-term rewarding, fulfilling career, right? But it, you probably have a great line of sight, right? Into who might have the aptitude, who might have the interest and that. So we're, we're talking about how we can better partner with our education partners as well to be able to identify those students and be able to help them to get to where they want to go for a career. Yep. So, and we have actually, we have three, I think we have three questions that are, so we'll do a, a one, two, three. Does that work for everybody? So we'll start back here and then come up here and then back. Yep. We gotcha. Thanks. Hi there, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate this. Um, I actually didn't have any questions at the beginning, <laughs> but now I have a whole slew of questions and I can't give you my card because it's a mess. Um, one of the words that come in, that, you know, actually that was mentioned here is silo. We live in silos when it comes to healthcare, whether it's silos in physical health, mental health, you know, so on. And I just wish that there was a way to have holistic health instead. You know, instead of segregating, let's make healthcare more inclusive. 
when, you know, physicians, you know, you're going to go to your doctor first if you've got, you know, anxiety, depression, et cetera, et cetera. Those are just the minors that I'm, you know, addressing. And the first thing you're going to get is a prescription. And then you go home, you take your meds, you feel good, you get yourself off the meds. There's no follow-ups. And, it, you know, it's not that your physician should follow up, but there should be some kind of a system in place that before that pill is even given, supports are put in place. I get very emotional with this topic, so I'm asking for forgiveness from now. Along the eastern shore, including Middle Muscadabit, we have had, and I've lost track of how many youths, adults, seniors that have died by suicide. Every September, uh, thanks to Bev Cadam, who actually also lost her son by, by suicide, there's a group of us that, you know, and Kent was there present with us this year, right? Because I wasn't able to make it, so I don't know if you were there. We hold a vigil to bring awareness. Um, I work in employment. I have people knocking on my door, and they're not going to come to me when they're happy. They're coming to me when they're not happy, and I don't have the services to give to them. 211 is my best friend, that's what I give them. You know, I hand over, I don't even hand the card, I actually hand over the magnet to them and say, put this on your fridge when you do need help, contact this. I'm here if you need me. I don't know what I can do, even if it's not employment related, come see me. About four years ago, could be even longer, we actually had um, a, health, a, a mental health wellness navigator, Anita Carter-Rose. That was a grant. The grant finishes, so does the service. Right now we have Michelle Williams, who actually comes to our Sheet Harbor office here at the Blue Water Building at the YMCA Nova Scotia Works. She is the hub navigator for seniors. Every Thursday, Michelle is here. I can't keep enough of Michelle's cards. Every Thursday, Michelle comes in and I'm saying, I need more cards. Because there's so many seniors, you know, from housing to, to mental health to anything else that they need to discuss with her. I don't get into any of that with the seniors because that's a privacy. I just hand over the card, make an appointment. Um, back to mental health, though, and wellness. Mobile crisis does not come to Sheet Harbor. That's something that we've been advocating for years. They come as far as Twin Oaks. In rural communities, the last thing a person wants to do is call somewhere and have the RCMP at the door to assist someone that's in psychosis. Either that or the parents have had to drive their child to the IWK. I just want to know where, where, where are you, you know, where are we, we all stand with that. Okay, yep, okay. I'm going to start, and I know that my colleagues will, will fill in for sure. Yeah, some folks, yeah. So I, there's just a couple of things I want to talk to you about, um, tell you about. The first one, to your point, around the silos. I do want to tell you that we are looking at one patient, one record. And um, what, what that does is it connects pre-hospital care uh, clinic care, to hospital, to primary care, all of those things. And, and the hope and the dream is that you will have your health, some of your health records on your phone. We saw that in other places. And it happens in other places. So we kind of democratize our health care so that we all have a role to play and it's not in a file, in, behind a locked door, in a building. So that work is underway. And, and that will break down a lot of silos and it will also improve patient safety and health outcomes and it's good for patients and it's good for clinicians and so I want to assure you that that is you know well underway it's going to be a big long expensive project but we want to move it as quickly as we can the other thing that I want to talk about is how important it is for for um, primary care providers to work in a team and have access to a team. And so the days of a couple of docs in an office that they rented, you know, that still exists and we're grateful for those docs. But we see new um, 
emerging physicians want to work in a team. They want to work with a nurse. They want to work with a dietitian. They want to work with a social worker. And to the best and most of our ability, based on the community needs, we're trying to implement that. So we know that team-based care is important. Uh, and I will just speak at a very high level and I'll let the folks from um, addictions and mental health speak that there is now an office of addictions and mental health and there is a minister whose name is Brian Comer, who is a registered nurse. He's a mental health nurse and working on a number of different things. There's a pilot right now in Eastern zone so that if you are in rural community and you have a mental health crisis, you actually can be seen virtually in a supportive environment so that you don't have to travel that the, um, clinician that's working with you and you can see a, um, you know, a mental health professional that's at further away and prevent that travel and support you in creating a care plan. And Minister Comer and his team are also working on universal mental health care so that it is more accessible. So there is a lot of work underway. It, it's early stages and, and we, we have one shot at this, you know, and we want to do it well. So I just want to assure you that it's important. It's important to our premier and it's important to Minister Comer. And uh, there is, is work underway. And hopefully when we come back to visit you again, we'll be able to tell you more. But before that, you'll see the results of, of the changes that are being made and the investments. I don't know if folks back there have something. Oh, there you are. I'm so sorry. Oh, you but I don't know whether. Oh, is that good now? OK. Nothing worse than having a face for radio, and then you got to get up in front of a camera. So that's not so good. Uh, but uh, th thanks so much. Uh, my name is Matt White. I'm the uh, interim director of mental health and addictions here in Central Zone. And uh, very well raised point, specifically about the mobile crisis team specifically, uh, but more broadly about our, uh, how do we access our mental health care. Um, you know, I thought you, you so nicely raised about 211. And you know, if you think about it, you know, there's, I don't know, give or take 70 or 80 of us here tonight. And if we were to talk about what our definition of crisis is, it would be as varied as our individuals that are here. And so being able to have the right resource at the right time is so important. And so that's certainly the mandate that we've received is to, as a mental health and addiction system is we want to be proactive, not reactive, and making sure that there's community supports in place when needed. I know that uh, here in this community in Sheet Harbor, we do have a psychiatrist assigned to this area. We do have a uh, community mental health nurse as well as a clinical therapist that come down. And uh, we, those things that talking about our virtual care options for the emergency department, th those are all part of our thinking to make sure that we're more accessible when individuals are in crisis. Um, we continue to work on building our provincial crisis line partnerships so that uh, between liaising with our community mental health partners as well as others in the community to make sure folks, when they do need that mental health crisis support, we can direct them at the right time. Uh, the last, I, just something quick to add, just as some of your broader comments, and Minister, correct me, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but how you say to your colleagues that you're the Minister of Illness and they're actually all the Ministers of Health because our colleagues in community services and in housing and in economic development, there's all the other departments really have a part to play in this as well, right? So Karen and I are very connected with our deputy colleagues as well across those departments. And they are all also working very hard, trying to, are working on initiatives, connecting them to our action for health plan, because we know that if someone is, you know, looking for housing or if they're looking for, that, that those are all things that can contrib contribute to their overall wellness, both physical and mental. So we're really working hard with our, our other departments to make sure that they are providing the services as well to keep our citizens as healthy as possible across the spectrum. Thank you very much. And so I'm looking at the time. We have two questions. So we have uh, Lisa has a question. And then we do have, I got gotcha. you. Not really a question, sorry. Um, really fascinated about, you're talking about Denmark. And I've had some significant conversations with Minister Adams around reality populations and around frailty. Because as a, as a primary care physician, one of the most frustrating things I have is, so for those things, I can get paid to go do an assessment of frailty in a long-term care facility where most of those residents are automatically significantly fail or they wouldn't be in a long-term care facility. But you don't pay me well to go and assess the people who are, who are out in the community and assess their frailty. So talk about being proactive. We really need the system to be more proactive 
in setting up services, expanding home care, expanding the team in home care. So we have lots of occupational therapists and physiotherapists, nurse practitioners that can go into the homes, 65 younger, start assessing frailty so we can put the supports in, so we can be proactive in keeping them healthy. We, yeah, here, exactly, yeah. yeah. We, I agree, and, and so we need to look at how we support people who are living uh, with chronic disease and, and senior citizens and, um, it, you know, and making it really practical. Like, I hate exercise, I'm just going to tell you right now. I do it, but I hate it. And uh, I was doing squats one day, and I thought, this is stupid. And exactly at that moment, the instructor said, we do these so that when we're 85 years old, we can get off the toilet. I was like, oh, I'll do more. <laughs> That makes complete sense to me now. So now there's a reason to do them. So, like, I would never have connected that if that, you know, she was looking a lot better than I was. <laughs> so it's really important. And certainly we saw a model in Denmark. Um, and, and I know, you know, to your point, if you have a good access to, to Minister Adams, that's terrific. And we want to continue to work to support people because we know people want to be in their homes. So thank you for your comments. Yeah. Thank you. In the back here. Thank you. Um, my name is Myrene, and I'm the executive director for Lee Place Women's Resource Center that's based out of here in Sheet Harbor. I was really happy to hear you, Minister uh, Thompson, talk about that you use a system-wide approach because as Sophie brought to you, it's not just about acute care and primary care. It's about the social determinants of health. Um, so, but on one hand, we put a lot of effort and we should be with retaining and recruiting, you know, those that work within the facility of a hospital. But yet on another hand, in rural communities, you see the decentralization of our support systems. Every time we turn around, we see our clinics or our, our departments that are here are no longer here, whether it's us losing our full-time income assistance person, now we have them one, one day a week. We see our public health um, system. We don't have a physical office. We now no longer have a public health office in Sheet Harbor. Um, we have child protection is no longer in our community. And, and little by little, they're done under the radar. But little by little, we, we are expecting others to pick up that piece of the puzzle. We don't have our diet. Di dietitian clinic, we don't have heart clinic, and all those things impact. I prob at our center, we probably have about average a month, we see between 200 and 250, we make contacts with 200 to 250 different individuals a month. Um, yeah, there's a lot of struggling people in our community. Poverty is a huge issue, and it's probably one of the most underlying issues. Um, which impacts all kinds of things, um, whether it's their, you know, their mental wellness, whether it's their physical health, whether it's the fact that they can even get up in the morning to do anything. So I, I guess for me, it's one thing we do do really well in rural communities. We do know how to be creative, and we do know how to collaborate. We're great at doing that, and it's just really hard on days when you have you know, someone coming to your door that's, you know, been in a domestic violence situation or that they don't have enough food to, to feed their family um, and things like that. So it's really hard because those kind of things impact all our health and it doesn't just impact that family, it impacts all of us. So I, I just really, um, the non-profit sector in our province is, we, there's probably, I think there's, Oh, 80,000 women that are employed within the non in the nonprofit sector, um, and probably it's one of the bigger. It's probably it's bigger than the fishing industry. It's bigger than the uh, mining industry. It's bigger than the contracting. So it's yeah. And so again, we talk about sustainable, adequate funding and how we're funded. Like the old schoolhouse, I we partner all the time and. They run some wonderful programs, but it's a fight to get funding. 
and all that kind of funding goes to the well-being of our people, keeps people out of hospitals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when we look at those things. Yeah. Sure. So, so thank you for that. To, further to the deputy's uh, comments, we yeah. are looking across government. And yeah. so uh, Minister Carla McFarlane, uh, she's from Pictou County. She is uh, Department of Community Services, yes. and she's also the status of women. Yeah, so we're funded under that yeah, so umbrella. Yeah, so we're working very closely around, um, you know, poverty reduction, looking at health, you know, housing. We work with Minister John Lohr. It's not fully cooked yet. But the in, you know we see how it's entwined and to the point that is the the determinants of health. I'm healthcare and illness, and all of my colleagues. So yeah. really around getting our feet under us a year in, understanding where we are, and uh, we know that there are a lot of inflationary pressures on families and people throughout the community. So yeah. we are looking at those things. Um, it, it's difficult to get everything rolled out quickly, but I do want to assure you that that it is uh, top of mind. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah. Minister McFarland has in her mandate letter yeah. that she is to reduce child poverty in this province. Okay, so good. And I guess, yeah, and I guess what I say, pe children don't live in poverty. Their parents. Their parents Their live parents. in poverty. Yeah. And, and I guess that's what we really have to look at yeah. is that if we give someone a livable income, then they're not going to be in our systems mm -hmm. and they're not going to take up our hospital beds mm -hmm. and our mental yeah. wellness beds and, and things like that. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. One quick thing is, in passing, someone said something about uh, looking at, I know if I go to New Glasgow, for, in which I do, for certain services, I, not necessarily will my records, do they have the ability to get my records back to my local doc, or the fact that they, yeah, it's not a, that great system that we were supposed to have, Nova Scotia system we were supposed to have, is really not that great right now. It will <laughs> Working be. that well. It so will I'm hope, be. and I'm hoping that will happen. That we yeah. don't have because we have lots of people slipping through the cracks because yeah. the information isn't getting back where it needs to be. Yeah. But thank you very much for coming down. Thank you. So um, okay, we have. I think we have time for. It. Actually, do you want to take one more question up here and then? Yeah. Okay. We're we'll take one question up here. You mean the last? We're getting close to the end of time, so we just want to make sure we get. Is it on? Or? Is it on? Yep. Okay. Um, Mike, I'm just concerned about the issue of doctor recruitment, and you had suggested giving money to communities to recruit doctors and such. I feel that that will create just more inequality because there's always going to be that community that may not be able to attract somebody. I mean, there's, Wolf feels way more attractive than Sheet Harbor. <laughs> no, we have to be honest though. Seriously though, my, my point is, no. what's the solution to, okay, we try to recruit. Are we throwing money away in doing that? Shouldn't it be more of a central, okay, yeah. we have a yeah. province, we need to staff our hospitals with doctors and our communities, regardless, you know, you brought up social economics, poverty, so it's going to, I just want to make sure that that's in your head too, yeah. that there's going to be people as hard as they try that are going to still have challenges. Yep. So there's a couple of things. So, so the, the grant funding is actually to support um, local community-based folks with seed funding. Again, like funding for them to host events, uh, advertise, promotional videos, those types of things. But we do have a physician incentive program that's standardized across the province. So in all rural, and you're considered rural, um, it, so we would have for physicians signing on, um, you know, certain incentives. So um, they, they would get the same amount of money regardless of where they work to, to equalize that. Um, and, and you may find one of the things that, that I have learned is that you may, you may bring in a physician or a nurse practitioner and you may court them and they may not be a good fit for here. And they may decide that they are going to go to Wolfville or they may go somewhere else. But there may be a doctor or a nurse practitioner that's being courted in Picto who doesn't fit there. And so every time, what one of the things that can happen is there's a number of these networks and we want to build that network. So we're adding to the pool all the time. So I, I think there's physicians out here who out there and nurse practitioners who would absolutely love to live here. And so that's why the match is so important. And, and the groups on the ground help identify those matches. 
and you know this is a good spot and this is why and so we kind of talk about you know nova scotia health and the recruiters recruiting the physicians and then the community recruiting the family you know and looking at how we settle the families and we wrap our arms around them so that money is really built out of an ask from these community groups throughout the province to say we just need a little help to boost but but the incentives and the contracts and all of those things are based on a master agreement and they're competitive and we look at all of that stuff so I, I wouldn't see, I, I, try, I, I don't like competition. I'm not competitive by nature. Some people will say they don't believe that, but I'm not. Um, but I just think it's a matter of, of being able to tailor your resources and your opportunities and your ability to court uh, and recruit to this community specifically. And that's the intention of the fund. But the other things would be standardized and we would support folks in terms of how they settle and all those things, yeah. Okay. The, um, Kent just mentioned, and I'll just comment, the, so we did receive a number of um, written questions, actually. There were many pertaining to the ER uh, and model of care and so forth, but there were others as well. Um, there was one question about masking. There was a question about uh, a model in um, the NUCA model from Alaska. So what, what I'm going to suggest is, and they... I even have answers to those questions here, but uh, uh, I think what we'll do is I'll make sure that every person that has uh, asked a question in written form gets an answer to their question. They're not going to go by the wayside. So if folks are in the room who have submitted a written and we haven't gotten to it, you will get your answer. So rest assured. And um, I'll go okay. back to you, Nancy. Thank yeah. you. And yeah, I, I would echo that, that in the experience that we've had in doing our community conversations, um, although we have, I think, run out of time every time we, we do it because people have lots of good questions and, and, and we want to make sure that people get the answers that they need to get. But I also know that the uh, questions do get answered and you will hear back. So if you've submitted and, and I always, um, I, I always have to say this, and I'm laughing because I know you guys have heard it now a few times, and but you guys haven't. I always say how brave it is for people to come out here and ask hard questions to the leadership team and also for the leadership team to come and answer those questions. So I want to say thank you to both sides for coming and to remind you that it is uh, going to be on a YouTube video, I guess, you can watch later. And I, don't, and I think we have some closing remarks here. Um, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. I'll, but it is my constituency. So I just wanted to say, uh, first and foremost, I have three or four things to say, but they're all going to be brief. Uh, numbers one through five that I want to talk about are all thank you to the three ladies up here at the front row, as well as, thank you, lots of applause, as well as all of the folks from Department of Health and Wellness, from the Health Authority who are here supporting. So there are probably 20 people here supporting. So thank you, thank you, thank you. The things that I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to say, uh, after all the introductions and all the, the, the praise and thank you, there's one person that we, they overlooked. Uh, so every minister has a special advisor, and the special advisor to the minister is really the gatekeeper for each of the ministers. So the, the MLAs and the CAs, they, we text with the special advisors way more than we do with the ministers. So Minister Thompson is so important and so special. She has two, and her, her number one A special advisor is Mr. Jamal Mansfield, who is here today. Stand up, Jamal, stand up. So proficient at his job, so amazing, so responsive. So thank you, Jamal, for everything you do. Want to make sure that you got some, some kudos and some love. Uh, it's been mentioned twice tonight, and I want to make sure that I publicly acknowledge two organizations in our constituencies that work hand in hand, not only with my office, but with Department of Health and Wellness, but, and with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. So the Old School Community Gathering Place in Muscadabit Harbor, and Leah Place Women's Resource Center here in Sheet Harbor. My office, my CA, Kelly, is in touch with the folks at those two organizations on a probably daily basis to work together with supporting each other to try and help our constituents the best way that we can. So I wanted to make sure that those two organizations got the kudos. <laughs> <laughs>